So we're going to be posting our sermons online. We always do. I don't know if you know that. But you could skip church any Sunday and watch a sermon online. But we're actually encouraging people to do that now who uh, shouldn't come for health reasons. So, um, and we put in the bulletin that we're going to have our sermons online by 5 o'clock on Sunday. I think we can do that. Unless the sermon's really long because it takes the computer a while to process it and you have to upload it to YouTube. So if it's like a three-hour sermon, I don't know if I can get it online by 5 o'clock. Just a little warning. I've only got 83 pages, so I think we'll be okay. Uh, should just be two and a half hours. But anyhow, um, just for the future as well, if we don't have church, for whatever reason, there will be a message online on Sunday, so if you stay home. Uh, I noticed one of our sister churches in Seattle, they canceled last week, and they just said, you know, they're in Seattle, so they're going to cancel for uh, all of March. Uh, they also have YouTube links to the songs they were going to do, so, you, you know, you can just click on the link, watch the song. I guess you could sing at home with it if you wanted to, but I'd probably just listen myself. And that would be more worshipful to God than if I joined in with a YouTube. That's my opinion. I don't know what God's is. Uh, <clears throat> but anyhow, so we're looking at the book of 2 Corinthians. And uh, we're getting closer to the end. Probably three more hours. Probably not kidding about that. <clears throat> but we're not going to do it all today. So this, again, is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Um, Paul, in the last part of the letter... Is trying to win back people who have followed the false teachers and false teaching. So there are a lot of people who have already repented of that. They're back to following Jesus. But there is this group that just, you know, they're still clinging to lies. Um, I think it's helpful as we read today's passage to, to know that Corinth was a city that was known for its boasting. Uh, you could say they had a lot to boast about. Corinth was a really wealthy city. It's in a part of the world that's very beautiful, so they could talk about how beautiful the hills are, and it's a port city. Um, it was a multicultural city. They had people from all over the Roman Empire, um, and they had a lot of culture. There were a ton of really beautiful, ornate temples, so people would boast about that. You know, we have the, we have the biggest temple to this particular pagan god, and you could come see it and, you know, get postcards. Maybe not. And they had philosophers that were renowned. You know, people would come to Corinth just to hear the wonderful philosophers. I, I always picture them like on the street, you know, like of Seattle, peddling their philosophy, whatever that is. So one of the things that happened in the church of Corinth, after Paul planted the church, he left, is that these other teachers came in, and they called themselves super apostles. Or maybe, maybe the people called them super apostles. Uh, they were boasters. They were slick talkers. They claimed the uh, promises of Jesus in sort of a new and maybe more powerful way, more appealing way for sure, because their message was sort of like, Jesus loves you and he wants the best for you now. You thought, you know, Paul would talk about heaven, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's not focus on that. Let's talk about the fact that God loves you, he's given you Jesus, and Jesus is going to give you what you need probably what you want, and he's going to do it now. You can have your best days now. All you have to do is, well, listen to me. And by the way, we are going to have an offering on the way out, and I expect you to give because the more you give, the more God will bless you. You know these super apostles are still around. Today, maybe we call them TV preachers or preachers of mega churches. not to say that all of them are like this, um, but some are. There's one that meets in a sports arena that the church bought for $105 million dollars, and uh, they can seat 16,000 people, although maybe not this week. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, folks, only the first, I don't know what it is in that state, <clears throat> 250 people. Here's a direct quote from this particular, what I would call, super apostle of today. Here's a quote. God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, and to fulfill the destiny he has laid out for us. I don't think Jesus would ever have said those words. But that's part of the message. <clears throat> that pastor is worth, uh, they say, between 40 and $60 million. So apparently God wants him to have plenty of money <laughs> and to prosper. Now, I mean, we can criticize that, and I will. And the wealth of people who peddle that sort of Jesus, those super apostles. But a lot of people find it really alluring and appealing. I mean, these are good-looking people. Uh, they're successful. Their church has a great 
show. I mean, a praise band that's all professional musicians, little light show. I don't know if they have a smoke show, but I would if I was one of them. And, and the pastor's a great speaker. I mean, you listen to a pastor like that, they are really engaging. They use great stories. They have, you know, they have a nice smile and all that stuff. Everybody loves them. And this is what was happening in Corinth. They had super apostles. And they took advantage of this young church. They were new Christians. They somehow coerced them into giving them a lot of money. Um, you know, you give, the more you give to the church, the more God is going to bless you. You know, and you, you want, do you want more money? Give more to the church. So that's sort of the message. They had a great show. They were great speakers. They were entertaining. They boasted about how God had blessed them. And you could just look at their chariot and say, yeah, God's blessed that guy. And then his message is that more appealing. So Paul, because he actually followed the real Jesus, considered that utter foolishness. So two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 10, and he basically declares war on these people. Not the way that the world wages war, but with divine power to demolish the arguments and the false ideas about God. And this continues in chapter 11, which is the passage we're going to look at today. Uh, he continues his response to these foolish braggers. So here's how chapter 11 begins. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the Spirit's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you received a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. We'll read more of, about from this chapter in a minute. I want to focus on these first few verses because I think the rest of the chapter flows from these uh, first four verses. There's a brewery in town that brews a beer that's called Chocolate Jesus. And when I went there and I saw it on the menu, I wanted to know more about this Chocolate Jesus. So I ordered it. It's a dark stout. And I drank it to just part of my research, and it was good. And then I got home and I Googled it, and Chocolate Jesus is a real deal. You can buy them, I guess, around Easter time. But it's also a song. And uh, these are some of the lyrics. Sunday. You want me to sing it? Don't get, don't get on my knees to pray. There you go. Don't memorize the books of the Bible. Got my, got my own special way. I recorded this earlier. I know Jesus loves me. Maybe, maybe just a little bit more. Fall down on my knees every Sunday. You want to sing? So we'll sing second verse together. Uh, no, no, we don't have to. But I did want to put the second verse up there just because those last few words, you know. It's the only thing that could pick me up. It's better than a cup of gold. See, only a chocolate Jesus could satisfy my soul. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Good. <laughs> One time I'm like, please don't say amen, Greg. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, that's a silly song. Naming... A beer, chocolate Jesus, is harmless. But the idea of chocolate Jesus does illustrate that in this world, there are a lot of false messiahs. And most of them are not so silly. They're a serious assault on our faith. They're alternatives to Jesus. And by a messiah there, I mean um, there are things or people, things or people that people are trusting in for meaning in life or for purpose in life. Or salvation. And it's where they put their hope or their future. And many are named Jesus. There are a lot of people throughout history who have talked about a Jesus who is not the Jesus of the Bible. Sometimes these messiahs are called things like Buddha or Muhammad or Allah or Jehovah or even God. But when you start 
to look at what's behind that word, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. So in Corinth, there were false teachers, and they were preaching a Jesus that wasn't the real Jesus, was not based on the life of Jesus, the historic Jesus. Their Jesus was a distortion. He was an image of Jesus that manipulated and, and exploited the people in the church to line the pockets of the false teachers. And that hasn't stopped, not since then, because we live in a world where there are competing spirits. And I don't mean... Um, I don't mean just spiritual spirits, you know, like when I was in high school, they would talk about school spirit, and you were supposed to be, you know, like find life meaning in the fact that you were a trailblazer, that was my mascot, and that somehow the colors of green and yellow were supposed to give some meaning to my life. That's school spirit, and if you skipped the assembly because you just didn't want to go because you thought it was stupid and you hid in the library, somebody would say, don't you have any spirit? I'd say, not that spirit. So that's sort of the spirit I'm talking about, that there are all these competing ideas. There, there's things that people are passionate about, they're excited about. It's really asking what captures the imagination of people, and there are a lot of things that capture the imagination of humans. We live in a culture of all kinds of competing spirits. One of the great spirits in our culture is kind of letting us down. It's the spirit of sports. What happened to the NBA and and Baseball, and how, as a culture, are we going to survive without some of these sporting events? That's really uh, the thing. What about, I mean, have you looked at the, your, your Dow Jones, your investments? I mean, one of the spirits that gives meaning to life is money and wealth. Politics is something a lot of people like to talk about. A lot of people are, you know, you know maybe not me, but a lot of people are into physical fitness. You know, they're just driven. Man, if they're not in the gym, I mean, I go to the gym at different times during the day when it's convenient. I see some of the same people in there all the time. I'm like, you're here at 9 in the morning and you're here at 3 in the afternoon? You must be here all the time. Some people find meaning in saving the environment or helping the poor or outdoor recreation, like being a trailblazer for real, not just a mascot. Some people are, they call themselves foodies. That's more appealing. <laughs> like they just love food and trying food and making food. There's something nice about that. Some people like to be called a gearhead because they love cars. Some people find meaning from their dog or their cat or their dragon. Right? These are all, and, and those aren't all bad things. I know you're thinking, who's got a dragon? Some people have dungeons and dragons. And you can find a lot of meaning in life through all that stuff. And they're not necessarily bad, but they steal our attention from things that really matter. And even good things can become idols when that's all we think about. When our life focuses on sports and all our money, all our time, all our attention goes to our sport team, there's actually something wrong with that. It's not the way we're supposed to be. There's a lot of competing spirits. And the truth is that not all gospels, you know the word gospel means good news, but not all gospels are good news. So the book of Galatians was written by Paul. It's the one right after 2 Corinthians. And really the whole book of Galatians is trying to correct a gospel that's not good news. Because in Galatia, there were people that were teaching, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior, and you need to follow the laws of the Old Testament, and then you'll be saved. Paul comes in and says, no. So, actually, he writes stuff like this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I mean, these are pretty strong words, right? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? It's like, and the answer is faith. By believing in Jesus, not doing anything, not even the laws that are written in what we call our Bible, the Old Testament, laws like circumcision that, you know, were part of the Old Testament covenant. I mean, that's what they were teaching. And in verse 3, are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you, no, are you now trying to finished by human effort by what you do or don't do? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by your observing the law or by your believing what you've heard? So in Galatia, they, <clears throat> they distorted the gospel by adding to it laws from the Bible, right? Not from the Koran, not from the Book of Mormon, but actually from the Bible and that is called foolishness. That's called bewitching people. I mean, if you add anything to the gospel of Jesus, you've taken away from the gospel of Jesus. 
anything added to the good news becomes bad news. So not all Gospels are real Gospels. The only real Gospel is the one that is based on the real Jesus, the historic Jesus, the one that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The message of salvation is all about Jesus, not Jesus and going to church on Sunday, even if you stay home. <laughs> Just added that, sorry. Uh, and you know there are religious groups, even in our town, that add to the gospel of Jesus in a way that negates the gospel. So, you know, Mormons are wonderful people, but the actual teachings of the Mormon church is Jesus and all these other things. And it's not the same good news that Paul preached. It's not the same good news that Christians follow. Jehovah's Witnesses, same. Uh, even Muslims believe in Jesus, that he was a great teacher, that he was a great man of God, but they do not trust in Jesus for their salvation. Uh, they don't preach the, the gospel that is truly the gospel. Now, in communicating the importance of this, Paul uses the image of a pure bride. So it's the week before the wedding. It's not a good time to run off with another guy just because his name is Jesus too. Oh, your name's Jesus? I was engaged to Jesus. Okay, I'll run off with you. Like you see the folly of that. It's just weird. So our pure and sincere devotion is to Christ. And that's the concern of this passage. That's the concern of the whole book of 2 Corinthians. I, you could just say that's the concern of the whole New Testament. And Paul uses the image of bride and groom here, as he does in some other places. One of them, Ephesians 5, where he says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. This was read at my wedding. It's read at a lot of weddings. I've read it at many of them. The two will become one flesh. Everybody's like, ah. And then you say, this is a profound mystery, but I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. That's the bride and groom that Paul's talking about. That there's this intimate, exclusive love relationship that we are to have with Jesus that is exclusive, that we don't share that part of our hearts with anyone else, anything else. And the image is of faithfulness. A woman pledged to be married. But then there's this stunning young man who is not her fiancé buying her a drink. Is it a chocolate Jesus? Maybe. We're not sure. And he's flirting with her. And Paul is using that sort of image to teach that when someone offers us a Jesus that isn't Jesus, a spirit that isn't the Holy Spirit, a gospel that isn't the gospel of Jesus, that we need to resist that. And maybe I should have put the word reject, run away. Any thoughts, any temptations that lead us away from Jesus. Paul uses the image of Eve in the Garden of Eden, listening to the lies of the serpent. And he mentions in that uh, verse 3 that it's our thinking that is vital here, that we need to be mindful, that we need to guard our thoughts from anyone or anything or any ideology or ideas that take us away from Jesus. There's a lot of good ideas in this world, but not all of them are good for our souls. So I'm one of those people that think democracy is a really good idea. I think it's the best way to govern a nation. That's probably a friendly thing to say here in America. But it's not the gospel. Like, it's not the same as the gospel. I think capitalism is a really good way to structure an economy, but it is not good news for everyone. There is something of greed and inequality and love for money that can breed in capitalism. It's not the gospel truth. And we need to be critical thinkers and evaluate and, and, and think about the promises that are being made to us by different ideologies and ideas, especially when they're religious, especially when they're in church. And I want to say almost especially when they're using the name of Jesus. Is it really Jesus they're talking about? Or is it some other Jesus? Is it a chocolate Jesus that'll just satisfy our tummies but leave our souls empty? Well, let's read uh, some more of the passage. We're at verse 5. This rate, it is going to be three hours. I hope you guys had a big breakfast. I hope Glory is okay with the kids. <laughs> How long would it be, Andy, before Gloria came in here with us kids and said, the sermon's long enough. All right, we're not going to test those things. So here's what Paul continues writing. I do not think that I am the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you 
by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? Because you know there's people, there's a saying, right? You get what you pay for. So if you get something for free, it's not worth anything. And Paul apparently did not charge at all. Somehow he had other people that funded his work in Corinth. I robbed other churches, he said, by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers and sisters who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia, and that's the region of Corinth, will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. So it appears as if he offered his gospel free of charge to expose the greed of these false teachers who are charging for everything and were clearly lining their own pockets by their ministry in Corinth. And so to sort of combat that, Paul's saying, I never charged you and I'm never going to. I'm actually going to rely on the support from the people in Macedonia, which we learned a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, these were actually poorer people than the people in Corinth. They were supporting Paul's ministry. So, verse 13. For such persons are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. And so these deceitful workers, these false apostles, often look like angels. They look like messengers of light that are shining their lights into the darkness of the world. And one of the things I've learned from this passage is that angels of deceit, of darkness, I mean, messengers of Satan is what Paul calls them, they can be pretty alluring. They, they can appeal to a lot of people. There's a temptation there that we shouldn't overlook. That's what Paul's teaching here, that at first glance, they look like apostles of Christ. They look like they're angels of light. So how will Christians in Corinth know the difference between the true gospel and a false gospel? Like, how can we today, in 2020, be sure that we're not being led astray? How do you know about me? Let's keep reading, because I think the rest of the chapter will help us uh, answer that question. The last little thing was a joke, right? <laughs> We're still wondering, actually, Rob. It's only been 25 years. We're still wondering about you. So verse 16, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. But if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confidence, self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. Paul is being sarcastic. I like it when he does that because it's in the Bible. If you want to, like, you know, do you need a proof text for your own sarcasm? Boom, right there. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes themselves forward or slap you in the face. To my shame, I admit we were too weak for that. He's saying, I'm sorry, I was too weak to slap you in the face like all those other people that you admire so much. I think that's a little sarcastic too. Whatever else, <clears throat> whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. So Paul's doing something weird here, unexpected. So he begins by actually boasting about the very things that these so-called super apostles are boasting about. He's saying, look, they claim they have these, these credentials. They're Israelites, they're Hebrews, they follow Jesus. Check, 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 me too. But actually, I follow Jesus even more, and I work harder. But then his boasting isn't the way that the world boasts. So he goes down a path that they would never think about going down. In fact, 
he starts to talk about the very things that they're criticizing Paul for. So they're saying, you know, these false teachers are saying, how can Paul be an apostle? He's been in prison. He's been publicly whipped by Jews in public. And, and now Paul's just going to embrace that all? And so he continues. Three times I was beaten with rods. The old translations say, once I was stoned, but then they're like, hey, people are using that as a proof text to legalize marijuana, so we're going to change it. So now it says, once I was pelted with stones. But the truth is, I mean, they, they almost stoned him to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? So Paul's not really a great boaster. It doesn't seem like, like, this doesn't even make sense until you read the next verse, verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That's exactly what he's been doing. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. One more weird boast. In Damascus, the governor under King Eratas had the city of uh, Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through the, his hands. That's a weird boast, too, because Paul showed up in Damascus as this leader, like on a big horse. I'm here to arrest Christians, throw them into jail. He's a man with power. And then he's like, yeah, and then I met Jesus, and I had to be lowered like a coward out of a basket in a hole in the wall. I mean, that's weird boasting. Some angels are masquerading as angels of light, but they're not. They're wearing masks to make it hard to identify them as angels of Satan. So how do we see behind those masks? And this long section of Paul boasting about all these things really leads us to this question to say, well, what are they boasting about? So Paul said in chapter 10, we looked at this two weeks ago, let those who boast boast in the Lord. For it is not those who commend themselves who are approved, but those whom the Lord commends. And this right, might just be the heart of it. How do you tell if somebody's really focusing on Jesus? Listen to what they talk about. What do they boast about? And if they're boasting about Jesus as Lord, the real Jesus in the Bible, and lifting him up, that's great. They're an angel of the Lord. But if they're exalting anything else, including their own accomplishments, be weary. It, it's not so great. You know that even a church can be an idol, right? Like, if the preacher boasts about the church, you know, the church says this, the church says that, well, I don't want to say I don't care what the church says, but I do care about what Jesus says. And if the church is saying what Jesus says, then it's great. You know, we can listen to the church. But if the church is saying something that does not agree with the teaching of Jesus, don't listen to the church. Don't listen to the preacher. Don't listen to the leadership of the church. We follow Jesus. So Paul is using this method of boasting to boast about his own weakness and personal failure, his terrible career, and his need for Jesus. If left on his own, he would have accomplished none of those great things. He would have never been beaten by the Jews because he was the leader of the Jews. And really what he's doing in chapter 11 is modeling what he says to do in chapter 10. If you're going to boast, boast about the Lord. That's exactly what he's doing. here. And it's not just boasting. It's also testing for knowledge and for truth. If we want to see behind the mask of people who are speaking about Jesus, about faith, about religion, then test the spirits by saying, is what they're saying true? So Paul says, I, I am not in the least inferior to these so-called super apostles. I might be untrained as a speaker, and my sermons might be boring. You might fall asleep, but I have knowledge. And I'm speaking about the Jesus that I've actually met face-to-face -face on the road to Damascus. So we need to look past the slick presentation and look, listen for truth. That doesn't mean that every slick presenter isn't speaking the truth, right? I mean, good preachers don't have to be boring. 
hopefully. <laughs> but just because they're really entertaining doesn't mean that they're talking about the real Jesus. So we have Bibles. We have Bible knowledge. I think that we have the Holy Spirit who also helps us to evaluate. It's not about the show. It's not about emotions. At the end of the day, we say, is it true? Or is it a fairy tale? Is it the Jesus who went to the cross for me? Or is it a chocolate Jesus who's hollow inside, who might make my tummy feel good, but it's going to leave my soul pretty empty? So the Bible leads, leads us, helps us. The Holy Spirit does. If something contradicts the Bible, I just want to say it's not true. It could be that you're misreading the Bible, right? So, I mean, that's why we talk to other Christians. When Bible studies, we're like, hey, you know what the preacher said? I don't know if that was biblical, and so we talk to each other in the church, and, and then finally we go to the, talk to the preacher, and it could be, I know it's never happened in this church, it could be that the preacher misspoke, but it could also be that you misheard, right? So there's this whole thing. But if you listen to a preacher, and he's talking about that earlier quote, you know, God wants you to be rich. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have a yacht like my yacht, and if you don't have a private jet, you are not praying hard enough. I'm just telling you from the pulpit. I mean, if you hear that and you say, but that's not the Jesus of Nazareth who had nothing, no place to lay his head, then you're not hearing, I mean, that person's masquerading. They're not really an angel of the gospel. So really, the question we're asking is, what gospel is being preached? And is anything being added to it? Anything for you to do or someone else to do for you? Because if it's not all about Jesus and the cross, then it's not the gospel that Paul was preaching in Corinth. It's not the gospel of the New Testament. If you read the book of Galatians, which again is right after 2 Corinthians, Paul is like almost mad, I think, because he writes that book. He's adamant that we have to cling to Jesus, not Jesus and the law, not Jesus and religion, not Jesus and your good works. It's just Jesus. So he says, Galatians 1 verse 8, but even if we, even if I come back and preach a different gospel, or if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, which was all about Jesus, let that person be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I'll say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let that person be under God's curse. Because when you add anything to the grace of God, you lose the grace of God. You lose the power of the gospel. So the challenge in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians is for us to guard the truth about Jesus, to do it in our own lives. We're responsible for our own faith and, and what we take into our hearts, but also in the church. If you're part of a church, and you are because you're here today, I mean, we need to guard the truth of our church. Part of that is knowing the truth, that we need to be people who study the Bible so that when we hear something that contradicts it, we're like a red flag goes up and say, hey, that is not what I'm reading in Scripture. So if things work as planned, if we keep having church every Sunday, starting Easter Sunday, we're going to start a new sermon series. And I'm, I'm calling it like fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's going to be all about just focusing on the real Jesus. And I think we did something similar to this in uh, 2013 where we just spent a whole year focusing on Jesus. But I feel like every once in a while we just need to say, you know, the book of 2 Corinthians is great. But as a group, we're just going to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the beginning and end of our faith. Because we don't just want chocolate Jesus. We need the real Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the truth of your word, and we thank you especially for Jesus, the only one who can truly satisfy our souls. Lord, we recognize that we live in a world of so many competing ideas, so many really beautiful and wonderful things that can lure us away from our devotion to you. So we pray that you would help us protect us as people from those, um, from those idols. And may we enjoy the goodness of this world without bowing down to those good things. May, may there be a part in our hearts that is devoted completely to you, Lord Jesus. May we be like that, that pure bride and you are our wonderful groom. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us as individuals here to follow you faithfully, and we pray that you would also help us as New Hope Fellowship to be a church that follows the true Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.